The mom is the first person you encounter in this world. Your mom. Your mom carries you. She carried you in her womb. She had plans for you. She's prayed for you. And it's true, there's like a worry gene that comes when you become a mom or a dad, especially a mom, because they're concerned for us, for our welfare. They know how hostile the world is, and they want to embrace us and protect us and shelter us. That's the heart of a mom. And we see that in the Bible. We see numerous places in the Bible where moms give of their lives, give of their prayers, give of their hearts to their children, to give their children the best possible opportunity in life, to prosper in life, to know God, to love God, and to serve God. And sadly, not all moms are appreciated. And that's why this day is so special, is to, to share our appreciation for moms and those special ladies who have sown into our lives and made us what we are today, who've been there to comfort us, to encourage us, to wipe our tears away, and to give us hope. You know, sometimes you need somebody in your life to say, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Sometimes we just get so down on ourselves that we forget that God is working in our lives. We're so overwhelmed by circumstances that we don't see clearly. And you know, God can give your mom and does give moms the ability to see the big picture and to give us God's perspective on where we are and God's heart. And that's one of the greatest blessings that we can receive from our mom is her faith and her love for Christ and her love for us. These are treasures that God has given us. And my prayer is that we, even today, it will do something to our hearts that we will have a desire to, to share the wonderful things that our moms have taught us and also to share our appreciation and our deep gratitude for the moms in our lives who have done so much for us. And we can never repay that debt. Amen. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go, <clears throat> in Proverbs 22, 6. Solomon says, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Once again, the mom is the principal so socializing influence in a child's life. This baby just came from God, and its heart is tender. And a mom makes the deepest impression on that tender heart. It's like putting a, an impress in a soft piece of wax, in a soft and tender heart. Moms have the deepest and the greatest influence upon a child as no, one, no other person can. And so a child's experience with mom is incredibly important because the child's first experience must be with a mom who is loving and nurturing, protective and caring. And this person will grow up secure in, the, in that love of a mom. This, this child that grows up will have emotional security and will be grounded and centered because he or she received the love and the nurture and the comfort and the strength of his or her mom. Amen? And that's vitally important, that we are now ready for the world knowing that God loves us and our moms love us, our dads love us. This is how God meant it to be. And the wonderful thing about it is that if we are deficient in any area, and we don't, we don't necessarily find that, that people are raised today in this generation in the nuclear family as God had it intended it. So there are opportunities for others, for us as the body of Christ, to step into a person's life and to pray for them and to love them and to nurture them and to encourage them that God has a hope in the future for them and that there is a way and a path that God has for them. And we can be a part of the blessing of that, 
child's life as that child grows. These are tr incredible blessings that God has given us to make a difference in other people's lives. We shared with you numerous times, but it bears repeating. The word train here in the Hebrew is actually related to an Arabic word, and it actually describes um, um, the mom who, for her infant, she would actually chew on a date, and that she would take the, the chewed or masticated date and she would run it across the roof of the baby's, her baby's mouth. And that would actually stimulate the nursing or the feeding response. So what is fascinating here is that a mom, by doing so, in the physical is inducing the feeding and nursing response, but there's a spiritual application because a mom can also give and impart to her child a hunger for the word of God so that the child would taste and see that the Lord is good. And the child would grow up wanting to feed on the word of God and would have a hunger and a desire to know the God of his or her mom. Isn't that awesome? That's how God intended it to be. Moms are the greatest gift and blessing and legacy that we could imagine. And one of the greatest gifts that a mom can give to her child is what Lois and Eunice did. What did they do? They invested themselves in Timothy, his grandmother and his mother had sown the word of God, and their faith was imparted into the life of Timothy, the spiritual son of Paul. And Paul brought that to his attention, that he had a spiritual heritage. You know, we have a natural heritage. We come from families. Our family has a history. And it's wonderful to know about the history of our family, good or bad. So we feel connected. There's a continuity. We, feel, we understand that we are part of something and that we are taking something into our future. But there's a spiritual heritage that is far greater than that. And that's the, leg the greatest legacy that your parents can leave you is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? And that's how we learn. We learn by modeling. And when Jesus is at the center of a mom and dad's life and family life, the children will see the priority they give to their faith. And as we've seen statistically, the children will tend to adopt that faith. That faith will be imparted, and those children will grow up, and their children will be followers of Jesus. Does that make sense? So we want to honor our moms today. You know, they don't ask much of us, do they? Moms don't really ask much of us. Their desire is that we live lives where we are fulfilling God's purpose for us. We are making our way in the world. We're putting to practice everything they taught us and everything they modeled for us. They want to see us successful. They want to see us joyful and have a blessed life. And they want to be loved. And I think that is one of the greatest blessings for a mom to see is that her children are walking in those ways and enjoying the life that God has given them. And they are prospering and bearing fruit for the kingdom of heaven. Now, unfortunately, many of our children grow up and they don't take the paths of their parents. Well, this says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. God always has a way of steering them back into his arms. And just as with the prodigal son, the arms of the father were open. In fact, the father was waiting and expecting his son to return. And he did. And the father embraced him. And the prodigal son was filled with pig swill. And that was offensive to, to a Hebrew. And yet the father did something that was totally undignified for a man his age. He pulled up his garment, put it under his belt, and he ran toward his son with open arms, and he embraced him. And he embraced him swill and all. And that's a picture of how Jesus embraces us. Swill and all. We're not perfected. 
when we're saved. He embraces us, our sins, and everything else in our life that defiles us. And when he embraces us, he doesn't make himself unclean. He makes us clean. And that's what Jesus does for us. Isn't that powerful? One of the great blessings is to study the moms in the Bible. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was probably a young teenager at the time. I mean, what an amazing concept of actually bearing the Messiah. You know, that was the dream of every Hebrew young woman, that she would bear the Messiah of Israel. And the Lord shared things through the angel with her about her son, and she kept them close to her heart. There are some things that God speaks to your heart that you, you don't even want to share it to anyone. It's between you and the Lord. He, he speaks something to your heart, and you just want to cherish it and savor it and keep it there. And that's what she did. And there was another amazing mom, and her name was Jochebed. And it means Jehovah is her glory. God was her glory. She was a remarkable woman. At a time when Pharaoh was threatened by the Jews, the Hebrews were increasing in number and threatening his country, his empire. They were threatened by the Jewish people. And he called for the, pretty much the extermination of the young boys in Egypt. And this is what the scripture says. The king of Egypt in Exodus chapter 1 said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them. You see, when what God says is opposed to what the government says, you go with God. We go with what God says. We are accountable to a higher authority than government. Do we obey the laws of the government and are, and are faithful and law-abiding citizens? Absolutely. But when we are called to do things that God prohibits, we are servants of God and we are accountable to him. And so he says, do not do what the king of Egypt they did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do. They let the boys live. In verse 22, it says, Then Pharaoh gave his order to kill all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. And isn't that interesting? The Nile was like a god to the Egyptians because its banks would overflow and it would produce crops without the yearly, the annual overflow of the Nile, Egypt would have famine, as they did in the times of Joseph. And so the Nile was worshipped like a god. And so Jochebed saw, clearly saw the calling on her son's life. She knew that he was special. And so she made a way of fashioning a raft for this child. And she was going to now take the child and she was not going to throw, the, the, her child would not be thrown into the Nile at the mercy of the Nile to be killed. She produced the raft, the boat, that would actually be used to carry her child into the will of God for his life. And isn't that what a mom does? Doesn't a mom fashion the raft that the child is floating on and travels on in this hostile world? Isn't there a parallel there between Jochebed's plight and the plight of moms today? And so the Naya was now meant to kill her son. But because of her faithfulness, the very waters that were meant to kill her son are the very waters that brought her son into the will of God. And she cast that little raft onto the Nile, and she placed her son in the hands of God. And that raft took her son to the very presence 
of the daughter of Pharaoh. And she saw that boy, and she knew he was a Hebrew, and she loved that boy and took Moses as her own, and he became a son of Egypt. What is fascinating about this is that she was looking for a wet nurse. And it so happens that Miriam, his sister, was near this whole episode. I mean, this was divinely orchestrated. And so she goes to Pharaoh's daughter, and Jochebed will nurse her own baby. Isn't that just like God? Isn't that amazing? And so he was part of, he was actually would have been in line for the throne of Egypt. Isn't that remarkable? And he was in the household of the Pharaoh that called for his death. You see how God can give you favor among non-believers? You see, when God goes before you, he prepares the way. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. And so Moses grew up as a privileged son of Egypt. But he now, being weaned, he spent the, the very formative and critical years of development, he spent with his mother and his father. And clearly he learned about God. He learned about his Lord, about the ways of God, and the paths of God for his life. Isn't that remarkable? God doesn't show favoritism. If he did it for Moses, he'll do it for you. If he directed Moses supernaturally, he will direct you supernaturally. You fashion that ark. You fashion that raft by sowing into your children the things of God and giving them a love and an appetite for the word of God. And watch your children grow. Your children will grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. They will grow secure in the love of God, in the secure in your love, and they will be equipped to take on the world and as Christians to reveal Christ to the world around them, to a, even a hostile world. You know, it's wonderful to see how some people who are hostile to God, that when you're with them, you bring the love and peace of Jesus. Not all of them will be touched by Jesus because their hearts are so hardened. But there's no heart that God can't touch and make a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Amen? And that's one of the most miraculous works of God, is to tra transform the heart of a person. And we're seeing that every day. And be encouraged. God will answer your prayers and transform the hearts of people you've been praying for. Amen? Do you trust him? Commit these people into the hands of Almighty God. And so Jacobed is was an amazing lesson for all moms today, even in the world in which we live. How much more do we need Jacobeds in our families? Hannah was another amazing woman. She was without child, and she desperately wanted a child. And her husband had another wife who was tormenting her and harassing her because she was without child. And this woman wept bitterly. She grieved. She cried out to God. And this was for a considerable time. God has a timing for everything. And in this case, God heard her prayer. And he gave her a son by the name of Samuel. And do you know, this woman was so gracious to God that he answered her prayer, that she dedicated her child to God. That meant that the child would not be raised by her, but he would be raised in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle. And this boy heard the voice of God clearly, the audible voice of God, because he was living in the presence of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that remarkable? Do you know, if Jesus lives in you, you're not only living in the presence of God, the presence of God is in you. How much more can you discern and hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and leading and guiding you on the paths of Christ? 
the will of God for your life. Isn't that wonderful? This is glorious. This is the word of God. This is the promise of God. This is available to each and every one of you, that you can know God, and you can enjoy the richness and the fruitfulness of this abundant life that Jesus promises each and every one of you. Amen? What is wonderful is God reveals himself as a father, but there are nurturing, nourishing characteristics and attributes that are associated with a mom. And God has those. And he says, Jesus says in Luke 13, as he's standing, watching over Jerusalem, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. You see, they rejected their Messiah. In Deuteronomy 33, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. This is a picture of the believer in the arms of God with his head touching the heart of God. Isn't that glorious? And so God is carrying See, we're children of God. God is carrying us. When we are carried by God, our ear is to his heart. Do you know when a baby is born, they take the, the newborn and place it on the mother's chest? Why? Because the child is stilled and comforted by the heartbeat of its mom, because that's what it was used to in the sacred, in the safe place of the womb. Isn't that interesting? And so when you're in the arms of God, you cannot help but to hear his heart. And when you hear God's heart and you love God, your desire will be to please God and him alone above all things. And you're going to then entrust God with all of the troubles that you have, with all the prayers that are yet to be answered, with all the hopes that may have been dashed. You see, there's no such thing as a hopeless case in God's sight because he's the God of hope. And when he is introduced into your life as a born-again believer, you have hope no matter what the circumstances. Does that make sense? And so rejoice in that. So the beloved of the Lord rests in him. You see, there's rest when we walk with God. And he rests securely. There's emotional securely, security knowing that God loves you. You are loved by God. You are precious to God. You are the apple of his eye. That means you're at the very center of his, of his eye, of his focus. He has his eye on you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is always aware of everything that's going on in your life. And his compassions or mercies are new every morning. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? That God is watching over you. And that he is a compassionate and a loving father who cares for you. And he knows what you're struggling with. He knows what your needs are. And he is able and willing to help you in your time of need. This is a glorious message. Do you see why this is good news? Now, you contrast this with the bad news that we hear in the world. But this ought to give us a deep compassion for those who don't know Christ because they're lost, they're fearful, they're groping in the dark. They don't know what's ahead of them. They don't know where they came from, and they don't know where they're going. But you have the light of life living in you. And the word of God is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. The word of God in you can bring illumination to people who are walking in darkness. Friends, this is why you are on the planet at this time. This is why God has raised you up for a time such as this. Even as he raised up Daniel, even as he raised up Deborah, even as he raised up Esther, even as he raised up Abraham. You have a divine destiny. And if there's anything I want to communicate today is that there is a high calling on your life. Pursue it with joy. Pursue it with hope. Pursue it with love and life and expectancy 
that God will perform everything that he has purposed for your life. Amen? So remember, the Lord is carrying you. And when he carries you, your ear is to his heart. Your desire is to please him and to do his will. Your desire is to rest in his loving and affirming and comforting arms. As a mother comforts her child, the Lord says, so I'll comfort you. And the Lord says in Isaiah 49, can a mother forget her nursing child? Well, clearly no. That's a rhetorical question. But he says, can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. He says, even though if an earthly mother would by some chance forget her child, which is impossible, God says, even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands, always in my mind as a picture of Jerusalem's walls in ruins. He is speaking of the condition of his people, Israel. And they are his children. And God says that I have written you on the palms of my hands. You see, your name is written on the palms of of the hands of Almighty God and his palms. You know, your palms, I can't see my face unless I look in a mirror, but I always see my palms. God is saying, I always see you. You're always before me. And your names are written on my palms. And your names were written on the palms of Jesus with spikes. Your name is written with the precious blood of Jesus. And your name is ever before your God. He will never forget you. He will never leave you. One translation says he will never leave you without support. Whatever that support is that you need, he will never, ever, ever, ever abandon you. He will never reject you. He will never leave nor forsake you. Shall we stand? I wanted to end with this one. Before I would like to pray for our moms and the special ladies in our lives at the end here. Just give me a moment. I want to share an, a fascinating story. There was a teenager who didn't want to be seen in public with her mother. How many teens are embarrassed by their moms? That's tragic. That's peer pressure. I guess moms are not cool. But God sees moms as really cool, OK? So there was a teenager who didn't want to be seen in public with her mother because her mother's arms were terribly disfigured. And one day, when her mother took her shopping and reached out her hand, the clerk saw her arms and was absolutely horrified. Later, crying, the girl told her how embarrassed she was by her, her mother's disfigurement. Understandably hurt, though, the mother waited before going to her daughter's room to tell her for the first time, what actually happened. And this is what the mom said. When you were a baby, I woke up to a burning house. Your room was an inferno. Flames were everywhere. I could have gotten out the front door, but I decided I'd rather die with you than leave you to die alone. I ran through the fire and wrapped my arms around you. Then I went back through the flames, my arms on fire. When I got outside on the lawn, the pain was agonized. It must have been excruciating. But when I looked at you, all I could do was rejoice that the flames hadn't touched you. Stunned, the girl looked at her mother through new eyes, weeping in shame and gratitude. She kissed her mother's marred hands and arms, and she was grateful. Amen? There are things that we assume. You see, we don't know the full story. Talk to your mom. Talk to the people you love. Their lives have not necessarily been easy.